Great, thank you. Good morning. Really happy to be here, um, not just because it's the south of France, but because I'm excited to share with you some of the work that I've been doing um, developing mathematical models for uh, targeted cancer therapeutics. Um, so cancer researchers are ever looking for better um, alternatives and complements to traditional chemotherapy. And targeted therapies are emerging as a really effective approach. Um, targeted cancer therapeutics are drugs, but they're designed to interfere with specific cells, enzymes, receptors, or other molecules that are necessary for the growth of particular types of cancer. As you know, cancer is the name given to over 200 diseases, right? So if you can find out what causes um, a particular type of cancer um, to, to grow and progress and target those specific things, you may be able to de design therapies um, that are more precise and uh, potentially cause fewer side effects. So that's the, the goal of these targeted approaches. So the targeted therapies that I've been looking at and that I'm gonna talk to you about today come in two varieties, two flavors. So I'm gonna give you um, two different types. So the first type is looking at blocking a particular bifurcation point in tumor growth and pro progression, and that's angiogenesis. So this is uh, the upper figure just showing, you know, uh, a sort of cartoon of a tumor growing and then blood vessels beginning to sorry, grow into it. Um, and if we could block that somehow, we may be able to keep tumors small in size. And so there are lots of drugs out there that target um, blood vessel formation. The second example I'm going to give you comes from the um, cancer stem cell uh, research field. So cancer stem cells are the drivers of many types of cancers, um, and there are certain ways of targeting that particular cell population that we believe um, can have potential uh, benefits to um, tumor reduction. So we're going to talk about both of those different types of targeted therapy. To begin with, let's start with... Um, angiogenesis, blocking angiogenesis. Just a little bit of the biological background. What you see out in the distance is the tumor growing. What you see in the forefront is um, a nearby blood vessel. Um, and in between is the space that endothelial cells would have to navigate in order to get to the tumor to form a new vascular supply. So in order for that to happen, um, tumor cells begin to secrete a wide variety of um, growth factors, and uh, chemokines, cytokines, and the most prominent one is VEGF. So VEGF uh, binds to receptors. You see the receptors on the endothelial cell surfaces, and then that's what causes them to move, uh, to proliferate, to survive longer outside of the production of a blood vessel and form a new vascular structure. So that's the thing we want to block. So my experimental collaborators have set up a system where they can grow human tumors fed by human blood vessels inside a mouse model system. The way they do this is they uh, implant uh, human cancer cells along with human endothelial cells on a tiny little polymer scaffold, input that into the flank of a mouse, and allow the vascular to generate, vasculature to generate and the tumor to progress and up to about a month, what you get is a fully human tumor without mouse cells really infiltrating and a fully human vasculature. Of course, the human blood vessels connect up to the mouse vasculature, but inside the tumor, they're made up of human blood vessels for about a month. So you've got this window of time where you're looking at, a, at pretty much what would be growing in, inside a human. So then they did a lot of molecular testing to see for the particular type of cancer they're interested in, which is a head and neck, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, what kinds of things were the drivers molecularly um, going on during that angiogenesis tumor growth uh, uh, process? And what they found was the traditional story of cancer cells that aren't quite happy, begin secreting a lot of growth factors, VEGF, stimulates the endothelial cells. 
But what they also found, which was very interesting, was an, a, a kind of crosstalk or bi-directional communication. So the, the endothelial cells would also then be, uh, begin producing the EGF, and um, it would bind to a, a receptor on tumor cells giving them a proliferative advantage and a survival advantage. So these two cell types begin communicating with each other and the endothelial cells actually play an active role in um, uh, the tumor cells becoming more aggressive and living longer. So this is one of the things we want to think about how to model is what if we want to stop all of this from happening, what are the targets that we could potentially look at? Well, we could design a drug that inhibits the production of these growth factors like the EGF. That's one way we could try to stop this. We could neutralize those growth factors once they're produced and while they're traveling um, through a tissue space in order to get to an endothelial cell, we could try to block it at that point. Or we know that uh, these growth factors have to bind to receptors on the endothelial cell surfaces, so we could try to block it at that point, block the receptor um, interactions. But this new um, information they got from their experimental setup was that um, the, the endothelial cells actually play a role in tumor aggression and survival. So we could actually try to stop um, the binding of the growth factors on the tumor cells as well. So those are all potential uh, anti-angiogenic therapeutic options, all targeting different aspects of the process. So which one should we use? Should we use them in combination? How do we know? Well, um, there are therapies out there that do all of those things. So the, the most common one that everyone has heard of is uh, a, 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 a sequestration um, drug that just blocks so that's the drug that just blocks the uh, growth factors um, after they're produced. So that's the first kind. I'm just gonna call it a ligand trap. It traps it after it's already made and doesn't allow it to reach the blood vessels. And then there are also plenty of drugs out there that block the receptor activities. Um, and so you can either block um, the receptors on the endothelial cells or you can block the receptors on the tumor cells. What we wanna do is build a mathematical framework that can be used to address the effects of these ligand traps, which is one type of treatment, along with blocking the two types of receptors, whether they be on tumor cells or endothelial cells, and decide whether um, those treatments should be given alone or in combination, and what types of results we could see um, in terms of tumor reduction. So over the last long, long time, I've been developing a framework to sort of address these questions. And it's a multi-scale framework in that we have a tissue level where we talk about populations of tumor cells, we talk about populations of endothelial cells, we talk about you know, microvessel density, things like that, which are sort of the cell tissue level. And then we also have um, a molecular level where we talk about we know binding events are important, so we don't stimulate any type of reaction from the cell without uh, binding of the growth factors, so we have that molecular level. And then we have the intracellular details of some of the intracellular details of what happens after that binding. The particular thing that we were interested in is survival. So we have an intracellular module that captures the stimulation of survival proteins within the cells. So we've got this framework. It does take a systems biology approach in that we have equations that um, sort of describe the rates of change of all of these different species at all of these different scales. Just to give you an example of the kinds of things we're looking at, at the cellular scale, we're looking at tumor cell and endothelial cells. At the molecular scale, we're looking at all of the receptors the, the VEGF, the growth factor, and whether they're bound or not, receptors are bound or not, and then at the intracellular level, we're looking at the expression of these proteins that um, lead to survival. And the molecular scale in red is um, the important scale for connecting the multi-scale model, right? So um, the molecular scale feeds into the cellular scale because when um, growth factor binds, we get proliferation of, of tumor cells and endothelial cells, and we also get upregulation of the intracellular component. So that is the key uh, scale. 
So this, like I said, it's a systems biology approach. So I did want to, sh to, to let you know that we've done some painstaking parameter estimation and um, calibration of this model. So first we could take a lot from the literature, especially from the molecular scale. They've measured all of these binding rates, association, dissociation rates, so we could take all of that. And for the drugs, they know exactly how the drugs work that block the receptors. So we could take a lot of information from the literature. But there's a lot of information that we couldn't take directly from the literature, so we had to actually break down the model into modules in order to fit it to data that gave us information on how the growth factor is expressed and how it affects tumor growth, how the intracellular survival protein um, is expressed and how it impacts tumor growth. So we were able to break down, reduce the model into certain modules that allowed us to estimate parameters associated with those things. So these are just some fits to um, a bunch of uh, data on those different effects of the growth factor and the survival protein. Then we had some data on what happens if you start to treat with um, the ligand trap. So we had some data that we could use, again, to begin the process of calibrating the model. All right, so what kinds of things does this type of model predict? Well, let's just start with one drug and see what the model can say about that. So I've circled in the middle the drug we're talking about. It's a ligand trap. It just sequesters that growth factor right after it's been produced. So the treatment window here is for 28 days, right? So we give the drug on days one and five for 28 days, and then we, allow, we wait three weeks to see what happens with the tumor. The black curve shows what happens when there is no treatment, so the control case, and we did fit the model to this control data in order to estimate a couple of the uh, remaining parameters on tumor, for tumor growth. And then we looked to see what the model would say if we gave two different doses of the drug. And we see that the model actually fits the data relatively well for the two different doses of the drug. We see significant tumor reduction, um, slower growth during the treatment window, and tumor reduction after. We also have um, information on the oxygen levels within the tumor, so we wanted to look at that. Of course, the vasculature supplies oxygen to the tumor, so it's important to know what's going on with the oxygen levels. Um, and what we see, again, black is control, blue is low dose of drug, and red is high dose of drug. The key take home message here is that this type of ligand trap therapy at low doses we saw could give tumor reduction and here we see um, we're not disrupting vasculature because our oxygen levels are still quite high in the tumor. So we get tumor reduction without impacting the vas vascular structure. So we have a smaller tumor that's much better <coughs> oxygenated, right? So we've created this window where we can actually follow up with uh, chemotherapies or other bloodborne therapies that would actually get to the tumor better because it's smaller with more blood vessels. With the higher doses, and even with the control, you definitely see that the oxygen levels are lower, even though the tumor is smaller. All right, so that's what happens with one drug. Now we want to see what happens with lots of drugs, okay? So, or, well, at least all three kinds of drugs. So again, in the blue, we have the, the ligand trap. In the red, we have what happens if you block receptors on endothelial cells. And in the yellow, we have what happens if you block receptors on tumor cells. So the way we're gonna compare across these different um, types of drugs, given alone this time, not in combination, but given alone, is we're gonna look at what happens to the tumor volume on the 49th day, so that's after four weeks of treatment and waiting three weeks uh, um, without treatment to see what happens with the tumor. We look on that very last day. Um, and uh, get uh, an estimate of the tumor size. It's the fraction of the untreated control. And then we're gonna give more and more drug just to see um, what we would expect to happen. So this is a normalized drug dose. It's normalized by the IC50. And what we see, if we just look at the blue, I don't know if my pointer's working. If I just look at the blue curve, which corresponds to the lag and trap treatment, more drug means smaller tumor at the end. Makes sense, sort of monotonic decrease. What we see if we just give a drug that blocks receptors on tumor cells is that, that's the yellow curve, it tracks right along with the blue curve for um, ligand trap treatment, but there's a threshold effect. Once we get enough drug in the system, we, automatic, we start to see a significant drop in the tumor levels, and that makes sense because we're actually um, directly inhibiting the tumor itself in this case. What was a little more surprising was the red curve. 
So the first drugs that were anti-angiogenic drugs that were put out on the market were of the blue type. The second were of the red type, right? So if we look at what happens if we give a drug that just blocks receptors on the endothelial cell surface, the model predicts an increase in tumor volume for low doses of drug. It's not until the drug concentrations get higher that we start to see any reduction. And when you think about this, it actually, um, the model predicts that the reason behind this is because if you're blocking the receptors on the endothelial cells, what you're actually doing is freeing up the growth factor to have its impact on the tumor cells, and that impact is an initial, an initial increase in proliferation, so you get larger tumor sizes until you get enough drug in the system to actually impact both. So that result was also something that the model predicted that kind of made sense when you have bidirectional communication between tumor cells and the vasculature that's feeding it. So then, of course, we wanted to look at combination therapies. So what if we give these drugs in combination? So again, same treatment window of four weeks on, three weeks off. But this time, we're going to give the drugs um, either alone or in combination with each other or all three at the same time. So I just want to point you to a couple of these curves. We see that the things that do the worst, the least effective combinations, are if you give the ligand trap, which is the blue, and the drug that blocks the tumor cells. Both of those seem to do the worst. You get the largest, you get the, uh, largest tumor for the longest time. And then the combination that seems to do the best, the purple curve, right, is if you combine those two that were the worst on its own, on their own, right? So if you combine those two, you get the best treatment. And in the middle there are all the other possibilities, right? So you can get um, all these other possibilities. So combining those two have the best effect. Not only are you getting um, slower growth during the treatment phase, you're actually getting um, a little bit of reduction after treatment stops, and that's the only situation where that, where that happens, was those two, were those two. If we look at the oxygenation of the tumor for all of those same therapeutic combinations, what we see is, um, again, for the two uh, worst treatment cases, so the, the red and the blue, we get a relatively a well-oxygenated tumor, but, but for the best case scenario, which was the combination of the ligand trap and the, the drug that blocks receptors on tumor cells, we get the best oxygenated tumor, right? So we've got the smallest tumor with the best oxygenation um, by combining these two approaches. So again, that creates a window to follow up that treatment with a traditional chemotherapy, which is um, how these drugs are given in combination with chemotherapy. But we have um, generated a tumor with a more uniform vasculature that could actually benefit from that kind of follow-up treatment. So the other thing I just want to point out is, so if you look at the, the curves that we didn't talk about, um, you actually get the steepest, the fastest increase. So they're actually, so these curves that we didn't talk about, um, you get the smallest tumors during the treatment window, and then you get this huge resurgence of tumor growth after the treatment stops. And if you look at what happens to the oxygenation, very, very poor during the treatment window, and then all of a sudden we get uh, a bit of an, uh, of an increase. So this is because you've created such a hypoxic environment, once you stop that treatment, the, the cancer begins to produce all of these growth factors and stimulates that growth uh, rapidly at the end. So those are the, actually the worst, uh, worst treatments uh, possible because small growth during the treatment window and huge resurgence after. So just to um, show these results in just another way, we were looking at, we wanted two features to, have to um, sort of occur from giving these therapies in combination. We wanted to inhibit the growth during the treatment phase, so during the first 20 to eight days or four weeks. And then we wanted um, to, so we wanted the, the highest growth inhibition during that uh, phase. And then we wanted the, um, the also to inhibit the growth from post-therapy, right? So we wanted the smallest increase in the tumor after uh, that treatment window. So the blue shows what's going on during the treatment phase, and the red shows what's going on after the treatment has ended. And there's only one case where we get um, high inhibition during treatment 
and low growth after treatment. And that is that combination, that synergistic combination of blocking uh, receptors on tumor cells and sequestering the drug at the same time. All the others um, uh, were sort of antagonistic in that they did not generate those kind of inhibitory effect, effects in both cases. So that's the first example coming from angiogenesis. So a couple of take home messages. One thing, so we did all of this in an in vivo setting where we're having vessels growing and tumor cells interacting with them. We decided to run the same simulations in an in vitro setting. This is what um, cancer researchers typically do first, right? Is just have a co-culture of two cell types. Let's see if these drugs are gonna work on these two cell types. It turns out if you do the same things in an in vitro setting, you get completely different results, right? So our model predicts that blocking uh, receptors on tumor cells um, is, syn uh, is, uh, is um, synergistic uh, in vitro, but not in vivo. So completely different model effects, depending on, wh on what kind of uh, experimental situation you're looking at. So the, dr the driving message here was that um, you really have to be very careful inferring um, response in the body from response in the, in the Petri dish. You get very, very different results. Where we're going next with this particular model is um, experimental validation of some of these results. We wanna make sure that our predictions of the two types of therapy that seem to work the best together really do work the best together experimentally. Um, we know that chemotherapy is usually the follow-up treatment to this, and we believe from our modeling that we create a window where um, the vasculature is high and the tumor is small, so chemotherapy should be more effective on, after um, our optimal treatment, so we wanna make sure that that's correct. And then we wanna move this into a spatial setting. Right now, our um, blood vessel density is just a function of time. We know that within tumors, there's a very tortuous, um, geometrical um, arrangement of blood vessels, and that could have an effect on how treatment is delivered and how the tumor responds, and so we want to add all of that in to this uh, as well. So that's the first example. We then wanted to use the same framework. So we have a framework. It's a versatile framework. You can add to it. You can subtract from it. You can change parameters to um, model different types of cancers. Um, so we wanted to see if we could add to this framework uh, the theory of cancer stem cell driven tumor growth. So what are cancer stem cells? Well, they have been identified as the drivers of tumor growth in a variety of cancer types. Some features that they always seem to have in all of those cancer types, they're always the minority. They're a very small portion of cells. Um, they self-renew, so they have the ability to make more of themselves with infinite proliferative potential. They are the tumorigenic cells, so they are the cells that can form new tumors, and they are the ones that are probably the most difficult to treat. They're resistant to drugs, radiation, and cell stress. So just like a normal stem cell, we might get a cancer stem cell that can differentiate to all the other cell types in the body, but um, the cancer stem cell is the one that can self-renew and give rise to other cells that have that same property. So under this theory, what you would end up with is a heterogeneous mix of all kinds of different cancer cells within a tumor at different stages of differentiation, all driven by this uh, culprit, the cancer stem cell, okay? So we get this heterogeneous mix. In the previous model, we had one type of cancer cell, one type of blood vessel cell. Now we wanna see if we add in this type of heterogeneity, what can we say and what can we do? So why is this important? Well, conventional therapies like chemotherapy would attack those cells that are rapidly dividing and those would be the bulk of the tumor, leaving the cancer stem cells surviving alone. That cancer stem cell is the one that can self-renew and regenerate new tumors, so eventually you're gonna get cancer recurrence with uh, traditional uh, approaches. New approaches uh, for targeting cancer stem cells would potentially leave all of the bulk of the tumor alone um, and target specifically the driver cell, the cancer stem cell. So you wouldn't see an initial reduction. You might think the therapy isn't working, but eventually those cells die and the tumor doesn't regrow because the cancer stem cells, the tumorigenic cells, are gone. All right, so um, how does this work? Well. We, 
my experimental collaborators had some data on how, how um, traditional therapies affect the stem cells. Um, cisplatin is the chemotherapy that's most often used, and what they saw was when they gave cisplatin to, to mice with human tumors, they saw an increase in the stem cell pool. So, not, so this complicates the story even more. Chemotherapy is the traditional choice of treatment, but if you give it, you increase the stem cell pool. You get more of the, the, the bad cells that can regenerate tumors after you give the most effective therapy that's out there. So what we want to do is figure out how we can target these cancer stem cells. And it turns out if you um, take a look at them, a close look to see where they are and what they are doing, it turns out they live near blood vessels. So they're in these vascular niches where endothelial cells, the cells we talked about in the last model, um, play a role in, their, uh, uh, in sustaining them. So endothelial cells produce a chemical, in this case it's IL-6, that increases the survival, self-renewal, and metastatic potential of these cancer stem cells. So there we have our target. Now, if we can target the production of this chemical, we should hopefully be able to contain the stem cell population. So how are we gonna target it? Well, we can trap it after it's made, or we can block the receptors that it tries to bind to, just like before, right? So does it work if you do that? Well, here's some data for um, an in vivo and an in vitro setting that looks at a drug, I'm gonna call it TCZ, that blocks the receptor that the, the IL-6 binds to. And without treatment and with treatment, you see that you get a smaller uh, stem cell pool in both cases. So what do we wanna do with the mathematical model? Well, because the standard of care, which is chemotherapy, and this new targeted therapy affect the cancer stem cell pool in different directions, one increases the stem cell pool, one decreases the stem cell pool, maybe what we can do is use a mathematical model to propose a rational dosing schedule for giving these two drugs in combination that would actually uh, benefit the tumor, or benefit the, uh, the patient and reduce the tumor. So um, we wanna combine them, uh, the therapies, in a you know, reasonable way and see what we can say about how that should be done. So we already have a modeling framework that I showed you, um, but we can expand it now. Instead of having just one type of cancer cell, we can have um, infinitely many cancer cells. We decided to simplify it down to stem cells, progenitor cells, and differentiated cells. So we expand the, the cellular pool to include this heterogeneity that comes from cancer stem cell-driven tumor growth. And we still have the multi-scale uh, problem of the cellular tissue level, all the cell types. We have the molecular level where we're looking at the binding of IL-6 to its receptor that causes the signaling. And again, the molecular piece is what connects the scales. We have the occupancies of those receptors that feed into the proliferation rates of the cancer cells um, in their growth and their death. So, and we still have the crosstalk, right? So we still know that um, the cellular compartment, the cancer cellular compartment is talking to, communicating with the vascular compartment bidirectionally. So we still have that piece in there too. All right, so what kinds of things do we get with this type of uh, modeling representation? Oh, first, of course, I always talk about what we do with parameters. Again, um, we had to do some uh, data-driven parameter estimation. We had to break down the model into modules to capture um, experimental data that allowed us to estimate parameters that we didn't know. We also had some pharmacokinetic data on the different drugs to make sure that we were getting their um, behavior in the system correctly. And then we could simulate the model and see what we could get. So the first thing I wanna show you is a direct comparison of the tumor volume under just the targeted therapy. So what you're seeing in black is control. So what we do is we fit the data to the control, we fit the model to the control data, and then we don't do any more parameter fitting. All we do is run a simulation and lay our modeling results on top of the data to see how well the model, can, model does um, on its own, no tweaking of any parameters. And so we see, so the two different green curves are treatments given on two different days and the modeling predictions for those, and the model is doing really well without any tweaking of the parameters. So what we can predict from that 
is uh, the stem cell percentage after these treatments. So again, black is control, green is the stem cell percentage in the tumor after each of those treatment schedules. And you see you definitely get a drop in stem cell number, as you should. Now, what happens if you give traditional chemotherapy alone? Again, black curve is what happens, um, control, and then two different doses of the chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is a standard of care, and it's barely doing anything um, to, to the uh, reduction of the tumor. And if we look at the stem cell population, so this is just two different ways of looking at a stem cell pool, we definitely see increases. After every dose of cisplatin, so it's given three times, after every dose of cisplatin, we definitely see an increase in the stem cell pool, and this just shows the percent increase. We get up to about a 30% increase in the stem cell pool after giving the standard of care. All right, so what happens if you give both drugs together? Co-treating with both drugs. This is the standard way they wanted to give the drugs, is give them both at the same time co-treatment. So we definitely see that control in black, giving two different uh, dosing schedules of both drugs, you can counteract the effect of just the cisplatin alone. So just the chemotherapy alone, we got higher numbers of stem cells. Giving these drugs together, we more than compensate for that. So that's all well and good, but we haven't really done anything with the model yet. We, we've just sort of made sure it's working as it should, right? So what can we really do with this mathematical model? We can try to figure out how best to give these drugs in relation to each other. So what we want to do is minimize the amount of, of the targeted therapy required for a fixed amount of chemotherapy. Because the chemotherapy is the standard of care, we know how it's given, we know what they typically do, we're going to keep that fixed. We're going to vary the amount of the targeted, the new therapy, and see if we can't minimize how much we have to give. At the same time, we want to maximize the reduction of uh, the cancer stem cell pool. So we want to get rid of as many stem cells as possible. How are we going to do this? We're going to change the timing and ordering of the two different drugs in relation to each other. OK. So we have to have a couple of metrics to see if we're, how the drugs are doing. First, the administration schedule. Um, we're going to give the targeted therapy for three weeks, or four weeks, or five weeks, depending. We'll see. And then for the chemotherapy, we're going to either pre, co, or post-treat with that drug. Okay. And then the three metrics that we're going to use to see if we're successful are, first, we're going to check what we're calling the IC70. So that's just the amount of the targeted drug needed to reduce the tumor by 70%. We're going to look at something called the scheduling index, and that is the ratio of this predicted IC70 for each dosing schedule. So we're changing the ordering and timing of the schedules. We're going to get an IC70. We're going to compute a ratio of that new IC70 with the baseline case, which is how they want to give the drug, which is co-treatment. So that's going to produce a ratio and number. If the value is greater than one, it's suboptimal dosing. I'm giving more drug than I than I did in the, um, the control case. And if it's less than one, I'm giving less drugs, so there's some kind of synergism happening between the two drugs. And the final metric we're going to use to um, determine whether our schedules are working as they should is the stem cell reduction. So we want the percented, percentage of induced stem cell reduction. So those are the three metrics. And then we can run simulations to kind of see what happens. So let me walk you through this table. So the numbers are just uh, different scenario, dosing scenarios that we, gave, that we ran. Um, gray shaded boxes are when we gave the targeted treatment. Remember I said we were going to give it for three, four, or five weeks. And every time you see the word cis, that means we gave a dose of the cisplatin or the chemotherapy. So the baseline cases are highlighted in yellow. That's co-treatment, right? And then we can pre- post or pre or post treat as well. And we can check all of those, all three of those metrics. And so if you just look at these columns, it just, I mean, look at the column for SI, we said we want that number to be less than one. It is never less than one, no matter what we do with these standard um, treatment strategies of pre, post, or co-treating, right? And if we look at our stem cell reduction, we're actually not doing too bad, we're all, but it's not changing very much. We're always around 50% of a reduction in the stem cell pool, which is actually not bad. Um, but we're never getting the drugs working effectively together no matter what we did um, with the traditional uh, dosing schedules. 
So we went back and said, well, if we look for non-traditional dosing schedules, maybe we can find some synergy then. And so what we did is begin to space out the, the chemotherapy and the targeted therapy. And um, we see in red the first case where we get uh, a, uh, an synergy index that is less than one. And then we ran some other simulations and we could get the drugs working really, really well together by spacing out the doses of um, chemotherapy and um, targeted therapy. So the best, re the best results are either co-treating and waiting a week or pre-treating with the targeted therapy followed by the chemotherapy. And you, in both cases, you kind of get similar synergistic effects. So the moral of this story is that we developed a, a mathematical modeling framework. We call it a framework because it's very, it's very general, it's versatile, you can add to it, you can subtract from it, you can change parameters to talk about different types of cancer. It operates at the intracellular level. It looks at things that um, the tumor does to increase its survival. It operates at the molecular level. It looks at the signal initiating events, the binding of receptors. And it looks at the tissue level, the reduction of the actual tumor itself. It's able to capture the mechanism of action. So some people might say, why such a systems approach? Why so many equations? Um, we really felt it was necessary to capture the real mechanism of action of these drugs in order to make these types of predictions. And we know that the mechanism of action is blocking certain receptors, so that's a key feature that needs to be in the model. And so we can use this model to investigate interesting communication types between important cellular components in tumors. So tumor cells are talking to endothelial cells. Um, you, can, you can add to add to this immune cells, which tumor cells talk to as well, um, and figure out the reduction in therapy based on all of the different types of communication, that cellular communication that goes on within the tumor. And then you can sort of predict how best to give combinations of therapies. Um, so what's next with this? So my collaborators already have a bunch of mice waiting to test out our, um, our uh, approach to see if our, our, the couple of strategies that, we, that the mathematical model predicted really do result in um, the best outcomes um, uh, in an in vivo setting. So we're, we're waiting for those experiments, and I sure hope it works. Um, and then we're also trying to move into a more spatial uh, version of this model. Again, we think the spatial component will be important. So just quickly, these are some of the people who have contributed um, to parts of this work, and thank you for your time. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Anita. Uh, excuse me, we, we, we need to use the oh, microphone what? for the question. Hello, Tracy. Hello. So good to see you after so many years. Um, okay, so I have a question. So as you know, cisplatin is a nasty thing, right? So um, it gives you tons of side effects. It, it's nephrotoxic, which is why I care. It kills a proximal tubule cell. It gives you acute kidney injury. It kills your hearing. So I'm wondering if there is a slightly different way. I mean, I like the, the question you asked, which um, how do you schedule your dosing so that you, you have the biggest impact on cancer? But can you frame it slightly differently? For example, um, how how can you, can you possibly have the same cancer reduction, tumor reduction, um, while reducing your cisplatin um, dosage? Or you want to optimize a combination of the two, right? Tumor reduction and reducing this nasty little thing that you put in your body because it's really, it really hurt the quality of life of the patient, even if they survive. You are so right, and that is an excellent question. So we did fix the amount of cisplatin, um, and the reason we did that is because <laughs> This, is, this was a new collaboration. I'm the mathematician. The experimentalist says, we know how to give cisplatin. This is what we do, blah, blah, blah. So we left it fixed. But absolutely what we need to do is reduce, we need to be able to convince them what they need to do is reduce the amount of cisplatin. They know about the side effects, and they know how hard it is on a patient, but they still give the same regimen. That's, that's just what they do. Um, so absolutely what we should do and what we will do is look at um, reducing the amount of cisplatin to see if we can. Cisplatin is the killer, like you said. It's the, one, it's the thing that really is killing the cells, uh, the bulk of the tumor. Um, the targeted therapy, we'll have to see if it, if it will give the same result, if there's a way to get similar reduction with less cisplatin, with, with, with less of the killing power of cisplatin. That's a great question. We'll have to see if that's possible.
Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. I also want to ask about the secondary effects of these possibilities. I also work on cancer research. Okay. And for instance, I know that the um, angiogenesis, I mean, targeting angiogenesis can be also yeah, have very bad side effects because when you block angiogenesis, then they become more aggressive and metastatic because they start migrating. So can you include, for instance, those secondary effects in your models to convince or to predict the biologists what to do and what not? Absolutely. So um, with the model that I presented here, which was a temporal model, the, we, we saw aggression. We saw real aggression after the treatment in terms of a steeper slope in the growth curve. But when we add those spatial effects in there, we'll definitely able to be able to predict how um, the angiogenic therapies impact migration and movement and invasion and things like that. That's why I, that's one of the real reasons we want to move to a spatial setting is because those questions are really important as well. Um, so the models that I presented today don't necessarily focus on the side effects, but that's certainly a focus we want to put back into those models. For sure. Yeah. Similarly, for the for the stem cells, that when you target them, if you affect the interlocking, then you are also affecting all the immune system and this, I mean, if it's possible to include the side effects and the cost of yes. yeah, the price of the therapy for that side. Yes, so you bring up an excellent point. I, if I had a little more time, I would have been happy to show you what we're doing with the immune system. That is a component that we are adding in as we speak to this framework. We're really excited about looking at the uh, crosstalk with the immune system and to add in a, uh, an immune uh, checkpoint therapy along with these targeted therapies. So that work is ongoing and underway right now. So yeah, we're, we're looking at that. And if I may, a third question. What yes. tumor entity were you showing? Because you, you showed some parameters that you adjusted for your model, but what tumor entity is that? Or towards what cell, cell line? Oh, what, what cancer type and cell yeah. line? So these are, um, oh gosh, head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Um, the cell lines are SCC1 and SCC22B, I think. Is there a difference? Um, yes, actually. I think I only showed results for SCC1. Let me see. Yeah. So these are results for SCC1. If you look at, and this is um, a standard cell line. If you looked at, we also have data for 22B, which is a cisplatin resistant um, uh, head and neck cell line. And the results are even worse in terms of what cisplatin does on its own. Um, so yeah, we have looked at how, how different cell lines affect these results as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you.